23rd of September, <laughs> still September. Now it is fall, um, orienting myself. I'm glad you're all here. Um, looks like uh, we've made it for another Wednesday, so thanks for coming by. Um, Change the Shed has been fun. I made myself a, a note here so I wouldn't ramble too much. I will be back next week on September 30th. The last day of September. How can it be? Um, so next Wednesday. And I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have very generously sent me donations for Change the Shed. It really helps with um, the tech. Um as you know, if you use tech or run a business, that um, it adds up really quickly. So um, I really appreciate that. You all have been um, very sweet. And there are some people who send me something every month, which is really um, very nice. Thank you so much. It's really appreciated. And um, in October, I'll be doing some book launch events. I will still do Change the Shed. Uh, but... Um, Stay tuned for some book launch stuff in October because look what came. This is my show and tell today. Um, this is an actual book. Look, it has paper inside of it. It's not digital. It's an actual book. It was a very exciting week to get this um, book. So, um, yeah. I'm glad you're all here. Um, good morning to all of you. Uh... Hello, hello. Oh, Janice, thanks. She says my hair looks so cute. I'm in the uh, um, COVID hair cycle. I managed to get one haircut by going to a new hair person who had nobody on their schedule at 7 a.m. And so there was nobody else in the salon, but my salon is now busy again. So who knows when I'll get another haircut? Whatever. I really don't think many of us care anymore, so um, good, good. I'm glad y'all are, are doing better. For some of you, the smoke is better. For some of you, it's not, but it sounds like you are weaving and um, doing all kinds of great things. Welcome, Crystal. First time she's come to the live stream from Washington. Glad you're here. Um, let me find my other camera. I, th I think I don't quite have this camera in the best spot, so I'm going to try not to make weird, weird camera things. But um, I just wanted to show you this book. Um, comes out October 27th. So I've had lots of questions since I've shown this on social media that I got a copy of it. The books come from the printer. They have to be distributed all over the whole freaking world. And so there's a lag time there. So they send me my book right away so I can be real excited and show it to you guys. But um, it doesn't drop until October 27. So if you pre-ordered it, you will not get it until that day. Um, a few of you contributed to the book and you may get your book a little bit earlier. I'm not sure when Story will send out their um, copies to people who have images in the book. But um, otherwise, October 27 is the day. If the US Postal Service is back on track, um, I might expect that you would get it on that day. So depending on where you ordered it from. So um, just, I will have, I actually have a new page on my website about this book. If you wanna see pictures of the table of contents and stuff, it's under the navigation. It's just called The Art of Tapestry Weaving. So um, look, pictures. Um, I'm pretty pleased with it. I think it turned out really beautifully. So, um, yeah, thanks for indulging my little, um, my little book, um, happiness there. Uh, so welcome from Athens, Greece. Yay. I love getting people from Eastern Europe and Asia and Africa because I don't see all that much. Um, I think there are places in the world where tapestry is a little more prevalent than others. And so some there are areas where I don't see as many people. So it's always fun to see somebody from um, Greece, obviously, isn't that far from some of the European centers of tapestry. But um, I don't see that many 
people from your country. So thank you for coming by. Um, good deal. Um, okay, so I saw, yes, Michelle. So good timing. This, Michelle is asking about this loom. This is actually my Aras, um, Schacht Aras tapestry loom. Sorry, let me do the ooh, nice shots of the interior of my arm. I'm going to have to reposition that camera. I ordered a new camera mount, so um, maybe we could make it work a little better. <laughs> Whatever. Um, this is the Aras tapestry loom, which um, I like a lot. I will, um, this week's blog post will be about this loom. So I'll have a bunch of photos and um, answer a lot of your questions about how this loom works. This is only the second piece I've put on it, but it's a much wider warp. It's 14 and a half inches. And it's one of those uh, doubled warps that I did that hot flash piece. I wove that one on a Mirex, but this one I'm weaving on the Aras. And, um, or Eris, I think Schacht says it. If you all are, if anybody's from France, is the word, or if you speak French, is the word Aras or Eris? Um, or maybe it's either one. It, the word is used, it's a place in France, I think, and I also believe it is a descriptor of upright tapestry weaving, maybe. Some of you will know and you will compare me. You will um, fill me in on what the right answer is. Um, thanks, you guys, with your book comments. That's very sweet. Um, let's see if I can move this closer. Maybe you won't have to see the inside of my arm. Um, so this piece, let's see if I can, if I can move this up here. Okay. So this piece is, uh, um, COVID, man, the pandemic, what else in 2020, right? Um, I think alien invasion is next, by the way, because, I mean, what else is left? So um, I've been rereading The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I just want to tell you the answer is still 42, but I still don't know what the question is. So that won't be very helpful when we get our alien invasion. So in the spirit of humor, because I really don't know how else to deal with um, life anymore, this piece is another piece in my, what I'm now calling my pandemic diary series. I have, I don't know, 10 ideas for pieces to do um, about the pandemic, but um, this is not a completed cartoon. Let's see if you can see it. This is the first part, so it's gonna be woven sideways. and. The title of the piece is, I thought there would have been, uh, wait, I wrote down what it was. I was told there would be a handbasket. So if you're not from the US or the UK, I'm not sure where this saying comes from about going to hell in a handbasket. That's where this comes from. You've maybe seen some of the memes about 2020 and um, I was told there would be a handbasket. That's what this tapestry is about because what else are we doing? Um, so there will be a, let's see if I can show you this sketch. I hope you can see that. So this is the initial, actually this is one of several sketches, but there'll be this, um, I've got a foot in here. Feet also seem to be a theme in my pandemic diary. Uh, maybe because they seem easier to weave than other body parts. I'm not much of a realistic weaver, but um, sometimes times get tough. So there's a basket and a person falling out of it. And I will actually weave the text. I was told there'd be a hand basket. And I think I'm going to put, um, actually, here, I'm going to put the year. Because that is exactly what it refers to. So my attempt at levity. Uh, not sure it's really funny, but it's funnier than some of the other things I could have woven. So I'm starting with... This is fire, so, you know, hell, handbasket. I'm a stylized representation of fire, so I've got out all my yellows and oranges and reds and have been um, trying to figure out how to weave something that looks somewhat like fire, but um, is sort of stylistic. Um, oh, thank you, Gisling. Um, Aras is a place in Belgium, of course. 
I clearly should have done my research before um, spouting off about the name of the saloon. Oh, no, she said north of France. Okay. Um, in that area, Belgium also was a huge weaving center um, in the, you know, big years of mural tapestries, Belgium was, um, was, and still, they do still do a lot of tapestry weaving in Belgium, so. Um, yes, yeah, so the EPI on this is eight ends per inch for the doubled, so this is, this will be eight ends per inch, and then, just like I did that hot flash tapestry, I'm sure those of you who have been with me for a while remember the endless weaving of the hot flash tapestry. Um, I will divide the, these warps in, um, so there's two warps in each of these singles. So this is eight EPI, and then I will divide them for 16 EPI for the detailed parts, like the little figure and probably the flowers in the, um, so I'm keeping this theme of these blue and white flowers in this skirt. And so that will be um, probably 16 EPI. Also the shoe to get this detail will be 16 EPI. And the words will probably be 16 EPI, just so I can make them look like someone scrawled them handwriting. Uh, so that's what that is. And um, feet, Christine, yeah, feet, probably my love of hiking. That could be. You know, walking sometimes saves me. Um, hi, everybody who's popping in. So, um, yeah, so those of you who saw the earlier YouTubes, um, Change the Shed, know what I was doing with this um, doubled set thing. But at some point, while I'm weaving this, I should do a blog post about the doubled set. I wanted to experiment. I did mean to get more of this woven before today, but here we are. Um, I'm going to experiment here because I think I want actually a few dark lines in this weaving, but I'm not sure. So let's just try it. Eccentric, so you need to really be careful with the amount of weft. And oh yeah, I'm gonna have to try to keep my shoulder out of that shot too. Also, I have a plastic table and it is not completely level. So that is the reason that the shaft actually this loom actually does have adjustable um, right back here this part is adjustable to um, fix that so um, that's helpful a helpful thing about this loom it has a really nice uh, stand system so I was using three wefts for this and I went down to two for this outline so it would be a little bit thinner. I don't know, we'll see if it works. A little too much. I am weaving this from the front. Those of you who have been with me a long time know that I weave my large pieces all from the back on much bigger looms than this. But this is a more realistic piece in terms of forms and also I am showing it to you and so weaving it from the front seems quite a good option. So down here, I thought this was interesting. Um, this is cherry red. So I dyed a color wheel for if, um, for some of my in-person workshops back in the days when we had in-person workshops. And this was the red. This is the cherry red. And so I pulled this out and I mixed it with this um, rust color down here. And I couldn't believe how much this looked like hot pink. Just that simultaneous contrast thing is so amazing. Um, 
it just looks to me and it I don't know how it looks redder on my screen but it really looks like hot pink here this is the color by itself um, just an observation about how colors change depending on what they're mixed with so I really want to get some um, yellow or yellow orange in there and I have a couple watch out for my head um, this is the acid bright yellow if you dye your own yarn with saber set dyes this is the yellow 480 I think or 180 um, all by itself it is seriously bright um, so I'm thinking this might be good for an accent but if I put a whole bunch of it in I might not be happy with it so I have some toned down versions and I think I'm gonna I also have a much lighter version I think I'm gonna put these two maybe I'll start with just this one um, Yes, Kate asked uh, what yarn this is. This is Hairspell Color Singles. And I really, this is the yarn I use for my big tapestries. And most of the time, if I'm weaving something at eight ends per inch, I'm gonna be using Hairspell Color Singles. Not always, but um, I really like this yarn a lot and I have a lot of hand dyed colors of it, so. Um, okay, so then my next question is, I did a split weft here. You might not be able to see it well enough how much smoother this is than this dark line I just put in. Um, it is my feeling that the fire imagery is both jaggedy and smooth. So I think I'm going to just go with this and see what happens when I don't put in the eccentric outline on this one. Hmm, that might be interesting. So I'm starting with an eccentric outline of this shape. I'm going to dump it all the way. There's two things I could do here. I could bring this back up to the top and then come down, which would keep my shedding working. Um, if I just start building in here, the shedding is going to be off. So this is a little steep for the eccentric thing, but, and because I did it here, it's even pulling in the edge of my weaving a little bit. A word to the wise, don't do too much eccentric weaving in a row, but I'm going to keep going with it. You can always take it out, right? I'm, I'm feeling pretty fond of this Aras shedding device. One of the things I like about it is that you probably can't see that, can you? Um... One of the things I like about it is that it um, has a tension control on it, so you can adjust with a um, screwdriver how much tension is in the little turn mechanism. And so, for example, when I start working on the 16 EPI part, I'm going to pick the shed most of the time. This The heddles are on here for eight and per inch. Um, but I can leave the shed just slightly open like this. Um, you can't really see that. But the... I can leave it open a tiny bit instead of opening it all the way and it will stay there. And then I can use that as an open shed and the other shed as the pick shed and um, it will speed up my weaving. Yeah, Kate, um, the other Kate is asking about predictive rules for simultaneous contrast. There, there are, there are, um, yeah, it, simultaneous contrast is the thing, if you're not familiar with this color theory concept, it's, it's a, um, it's the color concept 
put forward by uh, Chevriel at the Goblon, the die master at the Goblon in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Is that right? Um, anyway, that says that basically says that colors next to each other influence each other, which is absolutely true. Um, and Kate's asking if there are pr ways to predict that happening so that you don't weave a whole thing and then find out, oh my gosh, that thing that I thought was gray that I surrounded with bright green now looks like sort of puce instead of the gray I wanted um, because it picked up some of the color from the green. So there are some predictive rules and it has to do with simultaneous contrast. Uh, sorry, it has to do with a lot to do with complementary colors, how the eye wants to see the complement of a color. And so, um, for example, if you put a gray square in the middle of, a neutral gray square in the middle of a blue background, you'll see that gray as looking very orange because orange is the complement to blue. So um, that is one of the, the Probably the, my only answer for that. Um, in the design class in 2021, one of the first modules, I think, is about simultaneous contrast. So we'll actually do some weaving and play with weaving and paper. You can see a lot of it by playing with some paper exercises. Um, so we'll play with that because it does have a huge influence on your design. Color. Color has an influence on everything. All right. What do I think about this orange? Hmm. So far, I think it'll be all right. Part of, you know, sort of designing on the fly, <laughs> kind of designing on the fly here, is thinking ahead to like, okay, do I like it here? I don't know if I like it in this instance, but in my imagination, there is more yellow and orange, lighter colors up here maybe and darker at the bottom happening and in my imagination I can see that when this is balanced with other areas I might actually like it even if I don't like it right here but it's always a gamble because without having done sampling for this it's just a guess I if this were a very large piece I would have obviously done a woven sample Partly because I would have been committing so much more yarn to it. And dyeing yarn takes a lot of time. All right. So. Now. Yeah, Kate, so, um, that's what I'm saying about the shed. Kate's uh, saying um, you can adjust the depth of the shed. So yes, um, if the shed is all the way open and locked, um, let's see, hang on. I'm gonna zoom this out. So if the shed is all the way engaged, it would be, it's quite large. It's almost an inch on this loom. So if it's all the way engaged, the shed, you know, is quite big in both directions. Um, and I don't have this tightened enough that it's actually staying all the way engaged because I find that I'm so used to the smaller shed on the Murex that the sort of three quarter inch range is what is all I need. Um, but you can make the shed almost, I think it's at least an inch in one, in the up direction. It's a little more than an inch on this loom. But if you adjust the tension on this, there's like a little ball. Um, I have never taken this apart, so I don't know exactly how this works, but there's at the side, there's a little um, regular screwdriver screw that you can tighten or loosen. And there's a little ball thing that clicks into a part of this metal um, when it's all the way open so that it stays open. What I'm saying is that if I adjust that tension, I can just leave the shed open a smaller amount, which sometimes is exactly what I want, depending on what I'm weaving. So hopefully that made some sense. I'm gonna try to turn this autofocus off again. Okay. Um, 
So yes, I can change the size of the shed and it will mostly stay where I want it to by adjusting the tension on that thing. Um, great. Okay, so I beat that in. So here's a little technical thing. I wonder, you'll probably get sick of me adjusting this. It probably bugs me more than you. I just want you to be able to see. That's probably better. Okay. So again, the question of eccentric. So the other way to weave this curve would have been to start down here and then build it up a little bit at a time. I think I only want this orange part in this area. So I'm going to take it back down here eccentrically and I think I'm going to leave it there because that line is about as thick as I want and then I will start a new piece of yarn to fill in that area. Um, so McKenna said um, when you add the sh uh, shed on set eight so I have this, that's a great question. So she's asking how I have done the heddles on the double set. And for this, um, on my Mirax, I actually have multiple shedding devices and I'm pretty sure this loom is big enough. I could add a second shedding device. I just don't have one. Um, I'm sure Shaft would sell me one if I wanted one. Um, on a Mirax, you can put two shedding devices. You need to make the loom pretty long, but I could have a shedding device that was set up with heddles at eight ends per inch and another one at 16. I didn't do that on the hot flash tapestry. Um, if you do do that, you should probably put a handle on each side instead of trying to have them on the same side. Um, just easier to reach side to side. In this case, at the moment, I only have the heddles on at um, eight. So each heddle has two warps in it together, which is how I'm weaving this. In future, um, if I get to the part in the middle that's more complicated where I'm weaving a lot at 16 and I get frustrated with how long it takes to pick the shed, I can absolutely redo the heddles so they are at 16 ends per inch, which is a lot of heddles. Um, so yeah, if you buy this loom, it only com it comes with some heddles, but it only comes with a hundred. So I recommend thinking about that, uh, what your set is and how many heddles you might need and ordering more. The heddles are identical to the Mirax heddles. So if you have a Mirax, you can, I just put all my heddles in the same bag once I realized they were the same size. Okay. Probably going to have a shedding problem there later, but for now we're going to soldier on. Martha from Costa Rica. That's another fun place to be coming from. I've never been to Costa Rica. I hear it's a beautiful place though. I know some of you will ask me this. That just jogged my memory. I've had a lot of questions about international book orders on my The Art of Tapestry Weaving book. Um, first of all, I'll just say I, I'm not selling the book myself, so um, I've, I actually had someone send me a check and I had to send it back. Um, I am not distributing this book. It is published by Story Publishing and it will be sold everywhere books are sold. Um, but please don't send me a check for a book because I will not mail you one. I will mail you back your check. Um, because I don't have any distribution ability for this book. Uh, there will be 
there are distributors I know in Europe, Canada, and Australia. So if you regularly order books from any of those places, just look where you usually order your books. Um, but I was wondering about South America and Central America this morning, which is why Martha's Costa Rica thing um, jogged my memory there. That um, I don't know about distribution in South America, Asia, or Africa, so I will look into that. The publication dates for those other countries, Europe, Canada, and Australia are close to the US publication date, but they're not the same. So if you go to whatever Amazon you have in your country, it will tell you what the publication date is there. I think in Europe, the publication date might actually be much earlier. So some of you might get the book a few weeks before we get it in the United States. I know in Australia, it's in early November. Oh, I've totally lost track of time, you guys. I was just weaving along. Didn't realize it was 11 o'clock already. So, um, yes, Deborah, same size heddles as the Murex. I suspect that was an intentional design. I think textile um, production is somewhat expensive. The heddles are quite expensive. And um, if you've ever bought Merex heddles, you know they're somewhat expensive. And uh, fortunately, they're re reusable forever, so I don't lose them. Um, but yeah, I, I suspect that was by design. Or, I mean, perhaps the heddles they just needed, the heddles they needed were the same size. But fortunately for those of us who own many looms, they are identical. Um, hi, Ginger from the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Um, yes, Aniki. Um, Aniki's asking about Europe. I think, Aniki, that you're in Hungary, right? I know for sure that Weaver's Bazaar will be carrying it, but I also have seen it on the UK Amazon. So um, I know there will be there's a distributor in the UK, but I suspect there's also a distributor in mainland Europe, Germany, maybe. Story sells a lot of books in German, so I'm guessing that my German friends will have access to it quite readily, but I will find out. We still have a month or so to wait. Um, I will be doing some live events, which hopefully some of them will be fun. I'll do some talks about actually making the book. Like, I don't really need to talk a whole lot about what's in the book, but, um, okay. So I did this, um, let me see if this, come on little camera. There you can see a little bit better what I did. Um, I filled in this shape. I brought this back over the top eccentrically because the shed was off. So the shedding here, and I, I knew that was gonna happen because I left this this tail down here, is not in the same shed as, as the top of this. When I wove this back and forth, it threw the shed off. So, or when I added the new piece. Had I added the new piece of yarn on the other side with the tail out here, um, the shedding probably would have worked, but I didn't want the tail on the edge. So I knew that I could use this little trick to bring the, um, once I wove the whole thing like this, just to bring it over the top and fix the shedding problem. So now this is all in the same shed and I can um, add whatever next color I decide to put in here, which might be some more red or might be yellow. Um, this is the point where my, um, let's see, right here is the point where the center design starts. So here, I need to think about where I'm going before I get to that center part and how the colors are gonna interact between whatever's right here and whatever's in that center background. And I suspect that next week you will see what I decided when I'm back on the 30th. 
um, oops, there we go, um, 30th of September next Wednesday. Um, so Barbara, yeah, that's something I've been playing with. So Barbara's commenting on the shed of this loom um, versus the Mirax in terms of the heddle length. And I've been looking at that, um, the physics of that in depth because Mirax changed the standoffs on their looms in the last year and I wasn't a aware of it until a few months ago. And um, so I've been looking at the physics and why is it that the shed on the Mirax actually got smaller when they've made that change? And they are actually working on a simple fix for that. So um, thankfully, because the shed suddenly became half an inch instead of three quarters of an inch, which was pretty stressful for me, actually. <laughs> suddenly I was like, why is it so hard to weave? Um, so it has to do with the size of, you can actually see this here, how far apart those two, um, the two heddle bars and how long the um, the clips are on the loom. So you have to figure out the rotation, keep these from hitting the warp, but leave enough room that the shed can open. Um, so my experience with Shacked, I did um, some work on the prototype of this loom, an early prototype, and then I didn't see it again until I got this loom. But I worked with their engineer, whose name is Matt, and he is fantastic. And so he worked through, I don't know how many prototypes on this loom and tested it over and over and over. And I um, really respect that a lot because it worked out great. Um, that is me rambling. I will ramble more about this loom on the blog this week, so I'll try to reserve the rest of my comments for um, the images and stuff that I'll put on the blog about the loom. Okay. I know, I can't believe it's already, uh, I'm seven minutes over my half hour. So I'll see you next week um, at uh, 10.30 Mountain Time. Uh, Wednesday the 30th and we'll see how much I have changed my mind on this piece whether I go with these colors or whether I decide that gosh I don't know um, I actually haven't decided about the background color of the middle section and that might make me change my mind about the border but I needed to have fire in the border because there had to be fire somewhere so that is what I did have a great time um, weaving, you guys. It's Things seem super, super stressful right now, at least in the United States, and I think all over the world. So take care of yourselves, please, and stay safe, and do some weaving because I think it helps, or at least read a novel or do something that takes you away from the news. Maybe stop watching the news for a while. Um, anyway. Thanks for showing up and I will see you next week. Happy weaving y'all.